Hello and good morning. My name is Richard Miller. Welcome to Never Not Here. And I've been starting, we've been starting a series, we're calling it These Amazing Times. Maybe, maybe that's just coming to me to say right now, but these are amazing times. And, uh, and a lot of people have said it and predicted it. And, and uh, a lot of people have been involved in the Mayan calendar and other kinds of uh, uh, theories about how uh, the world is uh, getting more intense. That's probably a good way to say it. And uh, we can feel it too, because uh, uh, if you look at it, maybe uh, human emotion might be made up of uh, pain and injustice. You know, pain is God's deal, uh, whether it's a uh, natural disaster or uh, sickness or something. And injustice seems to be man's deal, uh, where we feel like uh, somehow what we believe in is not happening for us. And uh, in a way... Uh, we talk about uh, centeredness, let's just say, to make it really simple. And centeredness means that we don't have to uh, take it too seriously what, what our idea of justice or injustice is, and maybe even what our idea of pain and, and not pain is. So, you know, we'll go into this and see if I'm getting a good sketch of it or not, but uh, Somehow we see tendencies in the world, and these tendencies are not necessarily stable. And uh, we're always hoping that uh, tendencies, which may be acts of man, uh, would have some kind of stability to them, or a little bit more stability, or at least the ones that we could make stable. And so today we're having a really, a really good, and I think it'll be a very deep dis discussion because we're talking about two with two gentlemen that. Uh, uh, really have a clear insight, but they also have a, a knowledge of uh, man's agreement with man because they're both grounded in the, in the practice of law. And, uh, and I see that as just the way we build society. Uh, so let's start out. Please help me welcome Scott Killaby. Hello, Scott. Hello, Richard. Uh, nice to see you. You too. And we're with Sundance Burke. So hi, Sundance. Hi, Richard. Hi, Scott. Hi, Sundance. Nice to be with you guys. You too. Somehow we're searching for the truth, you might say. I mean, that's typically uh, a spiritual practice or a spiritual endeavor is uh, wanting to know the truth. And uh, a lot of our discomfort is when we discover um, an untruth, let's say, that people uh, keep repeating and somehow we realize it's not true. And uh, maybe we're in, in when I say these amazing times, I think we're in a, a phase of our societal living that uh, we're going to see a lot of untruths that are going to be uncovered. Uh, and maybe they're they're already starting to show themselves pretty blatantly, and maybe we're seeing it or maybe we're ignoring it. Uh, but I don't think we'll be able to ignore it that long. Uh, I don't know. Uh, let me ask Sundance if that's something that you've been noticing or. Uh, if you got a take on that. Well, it's, you know, it's really, it's an unbelievable time. Um, I, I never really thought that I would see this happening in my lifetime. Uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, I started to wake up to my own lack of integrity, which was really, really all that means is that I wasn't really in touch with love. I wasn't really in touch with my heart. I didn't really know who I really was. And I began a path of uh, disintegration of the ego, the, the one that was in conflict within myself. Um, I woke up to uh, an experience of love and it grabbed me so significantly that I realized that that was my path. 
And, and yet I also realized that that's what I actually had always wanted my entire life. That that actually was my search and that is what I had been seeking. And that was the most enormous gift um, I ever received was just to fall on this path toward love. And in that process, this egoic um, mental self that I had, the conditioning and programming within my mind that I identified with started to be seen for the illusion that it was. And it started to crack and it started to fall. And I started to feel the emotions involved in that, the energies involved in that. And what I see now happening in the world is that it seems that there's a chance for this awakening, awakening to, to the heart, awakening to love, to really fall upon the, my larger self. That, all those supposed beings that are within my consciousness. So this, this personal awakening seems to be the true awakening to consciousness itself as the true love it is. How about you, Scott? Do you kind of do you see this uh, the same uh, opening? Let's call it an opening. If truth is starting to shine, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, my path was a lot like Sundance's. I kind of really like the way that the words that he used, "opening to love." I mean, that's probably the best way I would describe it too, and. You know, is it happening on a larger scale? You know, I meet with people privately every day, all day, and there's increased anxiety among a lot of people about things that are happening in the world, having to do with uh, the supposed end of the world or the economic collapse. And so all of that seems to be coming up. Now, where that's going to go, we don't really know. But it seems, to be, it seems that more and more people are opening, are opening up to the possibility that the way that they've been living um, is a limited way in the sense that uh, sort of feeding those stories that really don't fulfill us. I mean, the things like just the greed, the fear, the all those things that I think end up turning out to be untruths in our, in our physical world, like, uh, you know, just the constant seeking after something else, really. Uh, I think, yeah, I've seen, I've seen people, more and more people are, are experiencing freedom more quickly and are more and more, more eager to. And I think, it, of course, I only know what I see, so I can't say about the world at large. I only know what I see, but, you know, I'll, I keep, I keep it open for the possibility of that. Definitely. Well, when you say the greed, the fear, you know, basically it seems to me that you're speaking of uh, insecurity. And in a world full of turmoil and, and uh, in a world full of change, and we've just noticed change in our lifetimes, we've noticed change where, you know, 30, 40 years ago, people have thought of having a career, you know, and then and like gradually it's getting so you have to be kind of uh, quick on your feet. But uh, in a world of turmoil, uh, the insecurity is going to be worse, right? <laughs> or the feeling of it is really going to come up right in your face. And... Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, when I, I kind of look at the trajectory, trajectory of my own life, like, or the lives of the people that I know, it's if you're living off of that constant anxiety about what's going to happen, you know, the question is, where does that go in your life? I mean, where does that lead? Uh, people, I find, I think they find whatever they can, band aid fixes along the way to reduce the anxiety and then to get back on the wheel of, you know, the addictive seeking and, trying to have and trying to maintain and trying to uh, hold their head above water. Say what you mean by Band-Aid fixes on anxiety. Well, I mean, uh, there's all sorts of medications that people can have. Sometimes they work long-term, sometimes they don't. Uh, I mean, getting a massage is a Band-Aid fix in the sense that you might get some relief, uh, but it's not necessarily long-term. It doesn't necessarily <laughs> help you see through that the story that's going on about uh, about your future, about who you are. So it's, it's just a Band-Aid is not really a derogatory term. It just means it's not uh, a thorough kind of seeing that 
really gives people a more permanent opening. There's really a deep dilemma um, that's arising to the fore. Uh, the anxiety has always existed uh, in the human being. The fear has always existed in the human being, but the circumstances that we're present with today are exacerbating uh, what has always been a present condition with a human being that actually is, is an entire collection of energies that does not know what it is or who it is. So we've been living on a false premise and that premise is, is now all the conditions and circumstances that have supported that premise we're being faced with directly and they're starting to crack and fall apart. And yes, um, the hidden fears, the unconscious fears, the hidden insecurities uh, are starting to arise in a way that we cannot avoid facing them. And the only thing that I have found that deals with that um, situation and is, is more than a Band-Aid solution is to discover who you truthfully are because there's one huge perspective that I think makes all the difference in the world. And that is, are you in the world or is the world in you? If you are in the world, which is the normal take of the human ego consciousness, it's impossible to deal with the circumstances and conditions that you face. But if the world is within you, and this is a reframing of identity. You're, you're, you're being faced with the opportunity to move out of, out of the mind identity, basically the outer look at life, turn yourself around and faced with the scary, the scary images that you're, you're forced to deal with, look inside and see who is really there. What is the deal with this fear? How do I deal with this fear? Who am I really? And so you turn in and you find this thing that's always been there, this power that's always been there that you've never really noticed, this, this totally present consciousness that never goes anywhere, that is never affected by this, the conditions, the experiences, the events, the things that come and go, the thoughts, the feelings, and really... It's like uh, we're almost being directed into meditation. The meditation on what is peace? What is peace within me, within self? What is at peace? And that is more than a Band-Aid fix. As Scott says, um, our, our human... Um, normal way to deal with this is to deal with things that relate to the body and deal with things that relate to the mind, but we've never really faced or embraced or been blessed to become aware of the consciousness, the pure consciousness that is always free and that quite frankly <laughs> uh, allows for you to have any experience at all in life. That is the miracle. My goodness, I'm having an experience. <laughs> so and, when and you say as, so when you say directed toward meditation, like sometimes you're just snapped into meditation. You're not directed into like doing meditation or something like that. You just you just overcomes you. It's just like a uh, force that's already here, and you just drop into it. But uh, I would I would want to ask this question that uh, um, we're saying that uh, in these times of not knowing. Uh, anxiety is coming up uh, greater and greater, but uh, anxiety is only a strategy or somehow, I mean, I'm not so sure that anxiety is necessary when you're not knowing and you're insecure because uh, at least I take it when you're saying uh, to know who you are, uh, who you are is just a flux in a, in a, in a great space. And uh, so there isn't any knowing there. And so then if you meet that with anxiety, well, you're thinking that anxiety is somehow uh, productive. Uh, 
I'm not so sure anxiety is the natural response, and that, that could be a teaching that would be more than a Band-Aid, and it wouldn't take a personal conviction that, or an admission that I'm, I somehow have awakened to, uh, to uh, a, a greater sense of me. You could just be told that, uh, hey, you never were secure either. Uh, <laughs> and so anxiety is not a, not a solution to it. I don't know. Is that possible? You know, the thing that came to mind is uh, people ask all the time to me or they ask the question, you know, what do we do with the things happening in the world? And what I hear is like a subtext going on is that I'm afraid to die. I'm afraid. I'm afraid of feeling this fear. In fact, it's, it's almost like a disconnection from that. And I like the way that Sundance put it is that all these energies are already here. Fear, anxiety, guilt, and then even after you awaken to what you are, to awareness, that any of those energies can continue to come through as well as any other state, experience, thought, emotion. That's definitely true. But once you sort of awaken to awareness, it's certainly you're then in the place to look at that from a different uh, from a different place instead of thinking of myself as a limited self living in time as a story that has to quickly figure out things out there and change things. Uh, so that I can feel better, but instead seeing it from awareness, being aware of these energies directly in the body as they're appearing. And then I think when people start doing that, all those energies begin to be seen very temporary. They're, they're temporary. They're not, I think when you take yourself to be that limited, inherent, separate self, uh, the anxiety is often unconscious. It's there, but people are not detecting it directly. And if they are, they're trying to work it out in the mind and the story. And it's just not really very effective. I mean, it just doesn't really work. And um, I think it's working for people at all, actually. Say and more Say that, more about that, because you uh, you said some really uh, in, uh, in very interesting things, that, that anxiety is there, but it's just not detected. And so then uh, the way we run, uh, we maybe don't admit that that's anxiety-based. But uh, is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's like I often get people that will say... Um, I have an anxiety problem or I'm experiencing anxiety or I'm afraid. And those are, those are words that point to something in their experience, but the words are not the direct experience of the energy in the body. And the words often come up to give us to sort of reinforce the sense that we are that time bound thought based self. So they say, I have anxiety. And then once that identification takes place, once that identification takes place, uh, then they're thinking of themselves as that limited self and then looking at the world from a sense of separation and then trying to fix like a lot of outward circumstances. And what I kind of tell people is what if you fixed all those circumstances, what would you have then? And you might think that you then have peace, but what if actually peace is already in your experience as what you are, which is just awareness. And then from that place, you, you look at this self that you take yourself to be. You see if that's really what you are. And then it's easier just to directly experience the anxiety. And when people do that, they, they often stop being so fixated on everything out there, which doesn't mean that we can't take practical steps to do things out here in the world. Obviously, that's on the table. But the view of all that, like Sundance said, is like the world's happening in me. It's just a way of saying um, I'm not an isolated individual over here trying to navigate through a jungle. It's more like, okay this is different now. I'm not that limited self. And when anxiety comes up, it's not happening to a self. It's just this energy coming through. And it's just, I think it just makes it easier than to deal with all these issues. Yeah. It, you know, we're, <laughs> we're coming to a very radical realization. I mean, uh, quite frankly, Scott's talking about when he deals with people and this is a this is the problem right here now. I I a lot of people will find this very um, difficult to deal with. But are we really people? You know, I mean, this issue of death relates to the body and identification with the body itself. And when I say that the world is within you, well, I am also saying that the body is within you. There's a real question here of whether or not we are mind, body, spirit, out of those three, the, the one that usually gets neglected in human life is spirit. And another word for spirit is consciousness. Um, I think that people can, as Scott says, meet 
these energies directly. And the only way to really meet them directly is to meet them as consciousness. When you meet them as consciousness, you could call yourself the witness. And literally, you are the witness if you explore this, because when you witness life, the only thing stable in this, in this appearance is this witnessing, is this consciousness, is this awareness. In fact, that very power, that very um, sense of being, very energetic sense of being, is the only thing that is actually present prior to, during, and remaining after every event, every emotion, every sensation, every thought, every impression. Um, and you could, so if we can start to meet ourselves from the witness, start to um, be aware as we engage with each other, as we engage with the world that is within, and not forget that this witness is here right now. This witness is sitting here, being here, and it is experiencing. Now that will give you some distance from these, uh, these emotions, these energies that, you're, that you call anxiety. Um, they may not be anxiety. I have to stop for a minute just because the feeling is important. So you said they might, may not be anxiety. Well, what is anxiety? An anxiety is a, a number, it's a, it's a mesh of things. First of all, it's a mental it has some mental qualities to it in the sense there's some identification with it. As Scott was saying, I am anxious. Instead of just being I am, you add the quality anxious to it, and then you take that on as, as a truth of self. self. But is it, you know? Um, if you just meet it as awareness, if you just meet it as consciousness, then you could stop at I am, and then look at the energies that are being labeled and, and see what they are for real. Now, well, that, is, that labeling process, isn't that just kind of like a belief in, uh, in risk? You know, personal risk, you know, okay, personal, which is like uh, the believing in, in a separation, but in personal risk, uh, when anytime you, that crosses your mind, uh, that's an anxious thought. You say risk? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, that you're not going to survive? Survival risk. Well, you know, and that, that's, and that's why I think Sundance is saying that it is radical, because in this kind of saying, you're not going to survive because you, not what, you weren't what you thought you were to begin with. I mean, the, the thought is that I'm the person. And it was a radical point when I saw that the whole story of Scott was this, this non-existent thing. <sighs> Okay, so I still call myself Scott, obviously, you connected to me under the name Scott, but there's a knowing, you know, that, and I take people through this all the time, they come to me with one particular problem about, you know, what's going to happen to them in the future, and they, they often come with, like, can you give me a fix for the anxiety, thinking of themselves as that story that has to work out that anxiety, and if they're open, I point them more directly, and I say, well, just look at the thought, I'm anxious, is that thought you? or just feel whatever you're calling that feeling, just sit with that feeling, is that you? And what about the thought, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, is that you? And they see for themselves that these things are coming and going, and they're just these little energies. They never make up a limited self, no matter how many times they look at how many other energies coming through. And it's actually just a labeling that makes them look like separate energies anyway. And so when they see that, then they're, you know, instantly it's like, okay, that's where... I think Sundance is saying is that, okay, now there's that knowing that awareness is realized to be what I really am. And from there, the game changes in the sense that, well, you meet that energy differently. Like he said, instead of thinking, I am this person who has to figure this out, you're actually looking much more directly as awareness at what's, as what's happening. And yeah, uh, yeah. A moment ago, you said that, uh, People can take action. It does, doesn't preclude that you could take action to adjust things. And even Sundance, I think, said something about your relationship with the world, uh, at, which to me meant that 
you know, you are taking action or doing something. And I think a lot of times when uh, you're doing some, you know, let's say you're behind in your rent, but you're working and getting some money and paying it off, uh, a lot of anxiety goes away. But if you're just sitting there saying, uh, that's only a thought, actually, uh, that I'm behind in my rent, you know, <laughs> then your anxiety is really going to, you can stuff it, but, you know, it kind of it kind of builds. And that's what I, I felt that you meant when you said, uh, Scott, when you said uh, anxiety is often unnoticed, but uh, operating. But what I would say is that we wouldn't stuff it. I mean, because the stuffing is like, uh, from from just looking from awareness, you can't really stuff anything. I mean, you could, I guess you could, just, there's some sort of distraction or something, but to really, like when, when Sundance was talking about love, like, what is that? Is it, is it a love for everything that's arising? Is it a total welcoming of everything that's arising, including the anxiety? And when everything is allowed to be there, when, when there's no longer kind of trying to stuff or manage or control or analyze all the arisings, I think we, of course, action is taken naturally, you know, just signing on to this conversation was an action. When I leave today uh, and I meet with people, there's action happening. But again, it's from a, uh, from a different place. I think the stuffing comes from a sense of, you know, really being that limited person who has to stuff something in order to navigate through the world to try to avoid something. But Well, think- stuff, stuff to me didn't really mean a, 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 an active stuffing because there's two kinds of ways to to av- av- avoidance is also uh, omission, you know, if I omit doing anything about it, that's okay, that's, that's an avoidance. Uh, so there's two kinds of action, really, commission and omission. So I either do something about it or I don't do anything about it. And uh, because uh, uh, maybe I misinterpreted it and I thought that, uh, uh, let me think, how should I say that? Uh, we're saying that uh, that's not me, it's only a thought. And you realize that these thoughts come and, I don't know, I'm not trying to parody what you said, but, you know, you, I'm trying to bring us back to what, you know, what is a, a common understanding of in the, in the spiritual world is that thoughts come and go and they're not permanent. And so then, uh, am I really a, a delinquent rent payer or am I just a, I'm just a space where <laughs> that appears? <laughs> well, you know, um, Maybe if I tried to frame the, this as a as a process, it might be uh, more understandable. Um, you know, the majority of the human race has always assumed that it has always assumed, literally, that it it knows who they are. I, in other words, I I assume I know who I am. That's that's been the common perspective of the human being. Uh, that's called it. Uh, in the Eastern tradition, that's called ignorance um, or illusion. What happens is is that at some point, for some reason, and call it grace or call it a miracle, um, some something happens in your life that calls that that brings that assumption up, and you start to realize you start to actually go into a state that's called, "Geez, I, I, I'm actually not sure that I do know who I am." And this is the beginning of the awakening when people start to question their self-identity. And because in the in the one hand, if 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 you're just like ignorance is bliss has been a statement, and it's actually quite true in many ways, in terms of what's really the challenge of this awakening. But you know, you don't know who you are, and you don't even think about it. Most people don't even think about it. And then the world starts to turn upside down. And all of a sudden, this false sense of security, this false sense of wholeness, this false sense of completion is called completely into question. And all of these energies arise with in- incredible force. And, and everybody loses confidence in, in the idea that they know. And, and this gives the opportunity to really um, transcend into another dimension of being, so to speak. That's not actually true. And maybe that's one thing I do want to say about the words I speak. They're only pointers. They're never the truth itself. Hopefully they will point you back to you so that you can discover for yourself who you are. But basically the process is um, you don't think about who you are at all. It never comes up. It's always assumed. All of a sudden, for, for whatever reason, it's called into question, 
and you go on a search for uh, self-discovery, self-realization. Now, that's where hopefully, um, or that's where some people are, it's been a small percentage. Um, with the events that are happening now, it may get to be a larger percentage. And that can be, become a, li a lifelong quest, or I've heard people speak of it in terms of, of lifetimes. But then when you're in that search, you know, you work with those others like yourself that are in the same search or maybe uh, self-realized teachers so that you can be guided toward yourself so for a self-understanding. Who am I really? And that becomes the, the critical question, really the only question. It kind of boils all of your experience down to one thing, solving this riddle of who, I, who, who am I? Who am I? So in a way, it sounds like the foundation of, uh, of spirituality is, uh, is separation and, and anxiety about that separation. And somehow without that part of the formula, uh, I don't know, does it, it never kicks off, it never kicks into gear. Well, you have to admit it's quite strange that we that we feel separate um, from ourselves and that we feel divided within our own beings. I mean, the human experience is a is a very conflicted experience on a daily basis. I mean, we even have voices in our head um, that are talking to us, trying to control us, and uh, you know, I should lose some weight, <laughs> or, or you know, whatever. It, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's unfortunately, you know, we've become identified with our mind, and basically, we have that's the God we serve. We, we, we become uh, programmed and conditioned to such a, an extent that we can't see or feel or sense who we really are. And the mind is just a very, the thinking mind is just a very, 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 very small aspect of, of. It each being maybe those voices every one of them depends on a preconception like i shouldn't have that much weight you know and so then each one of those maybe that's the unconscious part of the anxiety create creation is just like i have an idea that it should be another way it's this is not right and uh, every one of those voices i think comes from there uh, more than uh, not well i don't know if it's not knowing who you are uh well, it's amazing, Richard. You know, when you start waking up and you actually start self-observing and you start to see yourself, I mean, you might even just be driving down the freeway and, and watching all the thoughts that are going through your head and you're amazed. I mean, it's like 90% uh, of them are just completely absurd. And until you begin this, this, this uh, search for yourself, uh, you never used to notice any of that stuff. It used to just go on, and actually, it ruled you. It, it used to, you know, move you from here to there, and and cause all kinds of anxieties and and aberrant behaviors, and and uh, you know, really, all that's happening is that you're turning your attention um, to the place where it's needed most, and that's to yourself. Yeah, you know, I totally agree that you know, not only uh, ninety percent of your thoughts totally absurd, but sixty percent of them are the same thought, just bobbing up again and again and again, maybe with a little different twist to it but uh yeah when i talk about like the the sense of being a separate self is like the one way of talking about it is it's like a story of deficiency like that's just the broad way of saying people think that they're not good enough they're not attractive enough they don't have enough money they're imperfect they they're not lovable and you can just keep going on and on all that wrapped up is some sense of deficiency that seems to be tied to the sense of separation so when you were talking about you know what do we do like to, about the world on a practical level, a lot of what I think is that we're driven by is that sense of deficiency. I think it drives the greed. I think it drives the, the addiction. I think it drives the self-help industry. It drives a lot of other, the legal system is driven by those kinds of stories trying to work themselves out. And so much does get seen just by seeing that there isn't a deficient self or there isn't a separate self or that's not really what we are. That's, there's no inherent self there like that. I don't find a lot of people who really, really look through that um, having the same kind of issues of what do I do now because it, it begins to be more and more natural about how to move when that deficiency story is not the program from which you're running. Deficiency thoughts can arise and fall just like they did before but seeing that they, they don't make a self it's 
you're not acting on that program. And I think a lot of what we say practical stuff in the world just starts looking different. It just, uh, so maybe that's one segue into it. Uh, well, do we start looking when, at it? Because I think a, a lot, there's a lot of avoidance in, in a normal, uh, uh, numbed down life. Uh, and, and you're saying that the, pra the practical world doesn't look the same, but does it start to appear actually? Uh, because I think most of the practical world, uh, doesn't even appear to, to, uh, uh, being like I used to be, like I, I remember myself as. <laughs> hey, Richard, the, the, we are going in a different direction from the world. You know, the, everybody's going this way and you decide to turn and go upstream a completely different direction. I mean, it, it's, you look at the direction everybody's going and, and it's absurd. When you look at the systems and the structures and they don't make sense from the point of view of the heart. They can't last. They're not sustainable. And these are the words that we're using. You know, we're looking for sustainability. We're looking for truth. We're looking for freedom. We're looking for sovereignty. What's really happened, the human being has given its power away into programming and conditioning to be like everybody else. You're no longer a being anymore. You're no longer a sovereign being. Now you are a collective, a collective mind, a collective conditioning. And what we're really waking up to with this, with the exposure of all these secrets, you can see consciousness is acting on the world because everything is being exposed. It's all because being brought up in front of us you know we're starting to see the mind control that and and actually the mind control you might as well just call that the ego you know everything on tv i mean have you watched tv lately i mean uh I, i'm a man and I, I i swear to god i don't need all those pills i don't have all those diseases what is the deal i mean uh I can remember when lawyers first got the opportunity to start uh, advertising. I'm older than Scott. <laughs> you know, lawyers in the, in the early days, they didn't advertise at all. And it, in fact, it was against the ethics to do that. And then, you know, even so everything is being brought into this marketing. This, and really what the marketing is, it's just it's wholesale conditioning, wholesale programming. The, you know, the money man, the elite of the in this ego picture, in this ego dream, they want you. They want all of you. And, you know, at some point in this life, uh, hopefully we all get a chance to break away from that. And the only way to break away from that is to, uh, is to be, be quiet and watch. Watch. Well, I mean, uh, another way might be just to tell the truth, because all that conditioning has to do with uh, um, just a sleight of hand lie. Well, basically lies, basically. And if we start to tell the truth, even if we don't, I mean, if we just sit and watch, I don't know. I mean, is that, isn't that too permissive? Because it can sound that way. Um, but, you know, I wrote something on Facebook, sort of tongue in cheek to say, uh, let's start a movement called Occupy My Street because uh, to see the sense of lack that created Wall Street. Because to me, it starts from within. It starts from like, well, what, what created these systems? What's creating these systems is the certain kind of consciousness, which has bought into separation and then with that the sense that there's something wrong something deficient and then and then from that come the the mongers who are out to get and you know we all have those energies you know within us and so is it it's it's more than just like passively watching something it's like this is actually waking up through something waking up uh to see that you're not what you, you thought that you were. I mean, that's no small thing to look over. Um, I don't know how we're going to fix, if you want to use that word, all these problems by continuing to believe in the inherent sense of objects, separate objects that we have to chase, and that we are an object, and i got to chase other objects in order to be a better object. Uh, that kind of thing only works to a certain degree. I mean, well, it doesn't really work well at all, actually. And, and people, that's what's being thrown out to us to see is that that kind of uh, inherent object making and following and chasing and is uh, bringing us to this conversation, really. Does it work to uh, 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 see beneath objects and to see that the objects are not real? Okay, you could say, I own a home. Uh, that's a thought. And uh, you could say, I have a mortgage. That's a thought. 
And both those thoughts could be undone pretty good by another thought called, uh, this is a foreclosure. <laughs> and uh, so then that whole thing can uh, divest me in just an instant. And, uh, you know, so then that's an object that we can maybe ignore, but uh, other objects like I have a cancer or like my brother has Alzheimer's, I don't know if I can ignore, I can ignore it, but uh, uh, he's still there. It's, and I'm not saying ignore objects, I'm saying see through the sense of, an, uh, of there being separate objects, like see through that sense. It's not to ignore anything. When you see, like I came from a Buddhist tradition, part of what I did was the Madhya path, Madhya. Yamaka and that it's just seeing everything as empty it's not like denying the the functioning the paying the mortgage it's not like sitting back and saying I'm not going to pay the mortgage or I'm not going to go to the hospital even though my arm's been cut off I'm not gonna it's not it's not anything like that it's just like that to me it's sort of wake up first and then the mess gets cleaned up whatever the mess is it comes up from that that waking up to who you are first and it's I don't believe this is about ignoring anything, uh, an object. I mean, it's really not what I'm saying at all. Well, what do you mean? Uh, you're saying seeing through object, right? See, see through it. Is that what you said? Think about the case of like a, a addiction, like which is I work with addiction all the time. So when I was heavily in addiction, didn't even know it, but I thought of myself as something separate, as a self. Like that's what I was. And there were these other objects, people, that I could use and get love from. There were drugs that I could take and drive pleasure. There were all sorts of other things I could chase. And why was I chasing them? Because I wanted to feel better. Why did I feel bad? Because of that sense of limitation that was driving me. So if I see that what I am is not that, and if I see that that, that object that I'm chasing is consciousness, it's not something separate from me, it's not like something that can give me what I am, then that will obviously have uh, that will obviously change the landscape of what I'm doing in my life. I mean, it will obviously do that if the whole thing's coming from separation. And that's the whole, that's just one example. I mean, there's many examples of that. I am a person who believes, if you want to say a person who believes, uh, that it's not like you wake up to what you are and you sit and passively watch and then the world everything just becomes hunky-dory. I mean, there are certain actions that get taken. and that. But to me, to me, the first thing is to see what are you. That's the first thing, if, if people are interested in that. Because I just couldn't figure it out from the other way. I, didn't have, I don't have any answers when people say, how do we fix Wall Street? I have, I have no idea how to do that, actually. Maybe there are people who do. Uh, that's not what I'm interested in talking about with people. What I'm interested in talking about is who are you and who, who you thought you were, is that is that what you are? And is there something else here that is what you are? And look from that place and see how that changes the sense that there are objects out there. And then watch what happens. Which Somehow means, that people reflect the, uh, what they get from you, right? And, and in other words, that's an important ingredient of it. And when you see wholeness uh, in your relationship to a person, somehow that wholeness is a space where that person can actually step into. And so then, okay, you're saying, in a way, you're seeing wholeness of the person, but you're not seeing wholeness of, uh, of the manifest world. In other words, Wall Street, you've cut off and said, that's out of my purview. Uh, even though I'm uh, an attorney and uh, I know something about uh, uh, law and agreements and uh, telling the truth, uh, I'm not going to involve in that. And so then don't the people that come to you also kind of uh, automatically take up that kind of uh, isolation or uh, uh, is there a risk to it? Let me just ask that, you know, is there a well, let risk? Me it, let me say it this way. I can't imagine there not being a Wall Street as long as there's a consciousness that believes in separation. Or, and I'm, it's not even Wall Street. It's just that mentality of more, more, more. That That's a projection of what we think we are, I think. I don't think you can really divorce yourself from it, but I would just say start from within and see what this is. I mean, see it from, from within what this is. I don't know that you can just fix the thing out there and, and then everything's hunky-dory. And I don't also think that you just wake up and then everything's hunky-dory. To me, they're inseparable. What we're calling the world out there and what I am are inseparable. So I, I created Wall Street. You created Wall Street through believing that you were something that you weren't. That's the way I would look at it. 
And then once you see that you're not that, what happens to Wall Street? What happens to all that stuff? How about the, uh, that's, that's good. How about the uh, pot calling the kettle black? I mean, <clears throat> right now they got all these conspiracy theories out there. But I ask you, what is the real conspiracy? You know, it's what Scott's talking about. It's it's the society that has mistakenly assumed that it was a human being without including the freedom, a human being without including the love, a human being without including the peace um, that would allow the, the real human being to emerge, the, tr the authentic human being, the one that isn't wearing masks, the one that isn't lacking. And, you know, the, the mass consciousness of the human being that, that sees other people, other things, that is relying on the mind to define the reality of being, the reality of life, by actually using the subject-object duality mode of, of the mental processes, turning everything into an object, turning relationships into an object. Uh, as Scott says, me and you, I use you, you use me, we make an agreement. When that agreement's broken, we, we go find someone else to try to merge with, to, to find our happiness, our love, our fulfillment, our success. All these systems, you know, from, re from the time I started reading the history books, I, I, as a young child, I was kind of incredulous and, and later, uh, turned out I didn't like history at all because it was like it was the same old story one century after another uh, You know 100 years 100 years 100 years all the same thing always conflict always fighting always no peace always talking in peace But never achieving it uh, It's almost like the movies, fight. right? It's almost like the movies, you know, <laughs> they've never stopped doing cowboys and Indians, right? It just it just there was a, there was a certain sense of absurdity to it You know, it just it and I actually took it personally. I felt like I have to solve this. I have got to figure this out. This is not right. So I just had a general sense from a very young age that, that this world I had found myself living in was just uh, really wacky and certainly not the truth. So at some point, you know, without any real intention, I, I got lit on fire uh, for looking into that. And, and, and I think that's, a pro, that's an opportunity in, in these present times for, uh, it's possible, I would think, that if, if, if large numbers of so-called people <laughs> um, started looking at the truth of who they are, that we could form a new consensus of who we are. Uh, I think that, that would be an amazing know, it, thing. You know, I think that maybe it could be way, way simpler even if we just start telling the truth about a few things. You know, like, for instance, a, a little simple example is like we say national debt. So a debt uh, kind of means a loan that, you know, and a loan means that you borrow and that there's a possibility that you'd pay it back. And uh, so then if you just kind of look at the structure of our, our national float fund, uh, it's not really a debt because uh, it's inconceivable that it would, will ever be paid back. I mean... Uh, we owe 15 and we, uh, uh, we, ma uh, we make two and we spend three and a half. And so then tomorrow we're going to owe, uh, next year we'll owe 16 and a half. And the year after we'll owe, owe uh, uh, 18. And so then in order to pay uh, 15, even in 30 years, we'd have to pay a half every year, which would mean uh, 500 billion a year. Uh, so it's not really a debt. You know, to call it a national debt just makes everyone think, so oh, we should be working to pay that back or something. We should just call it the, the rich man's uh, revolving float fund or uh, relief fund or something like that. And then if we tell the truth about that, we could say, well, okay, well, maybe the rich men need a revolving float, uh, relief fund or maybe they don't. And then, uh, and then we'd all start to uh, see it in a, in a different kind of a way. And I don't know if it ever should be paid off or what it is, but it certainly is not a debt or a loan or, uh, you know, it's, and it's used for something totally different to create a bubble, I guess, to pump air into, the, into our lives and uh, pretend like that's real. I mean, we can do that. We you know, can do, sure. I mean, we've been trying to do that, all, sort of, all sorts of practical steps. But it's like, oh, say, so we get that, that problem fixed. Have we really fixed 
anything in the larger sense. So then this other thing pops up. Well, then we've got the social security problem. And then we've got the health care issue. And then we've got the Wall Street thing. And we've got all these things. And it's like the, the whack-a-mole thing, you know, like at the carnival where you keep whacking yeah. the mole. <laughs> like you get that mole down and this other mole pops and up. The, the, the and so we've been doing that for years. We've been doing that for a long time, this kind of thing. So the question is, where is all that coming from? Like, well, all that stuff that's manifesting. If I look, if I look further back, oh, okay, I see. I'm seeking. I'm, I'm, I, I feel a sense of lack. There's something wrong. That's what it feels like. Okay, so, it, it, but if I deal with that, if I deal with that, is that really what I am? Whatever that is, then it's like, okay, from a different place, it's like I'm not whacking moles anymore. There may be some practical things that happen then. We might look at the whole thing differently, so to speak. We'll look at the whole thing differently. We might rearrange, make practical steps just like we have been. But we've taken care of a root issue, which is the thing that, that created the thing in the first place. That's it, because it's inseparable. What I am is inseparable from the problems out there. It's like I can't, it's one thing. It's like one thing happening, and I am that thing. I'm, I'm all the moles, you know. Like the consciousness is all the moles. We're, we're creating it and then trying to fix our creation. It's like sitting yeah. in a movie theater and trying to change the movie by going up to the screen and move the characters yeah. around, but it doesn't work. you got to go to the projector. Yeah. You have to go to the projector and where it's coming from and, and, and work with that and see what that is. And then it just becomes easier. I mean, I, I guess I'm just be asking like you, I know you do know who you are. You, are you, you have kind of seen through separation. And so then wouldn't it be, I don't know. I guess I'm just putting it on you. Wouldn't it be like the next step is to go out and take some practical steps? Yeah. I mean, of course, there's practical steps being taken every day. I mean, yeah. I don't have necessarily the answers on the practical level of, of some of that stuff. I might have something to say about the legal system um, if, if, I, if that question were asked. Um, yeah, I mean, I, nothing comes to me yeah. about your answer. Your question. But. Well, I mean, it's all one problem, isn't it? Because we're saying it's all different. This Social Security, it's the debt, it's the uh, defense, it's this. It's all one problem. Is the only growth uh, in the economy has to be on productivity, which will make uh, a real personal income, and all the other growths on top that are stimulated from the top down and that don't include uh, productivity and real personal income are false growths, and and there and there's something that's siphoned off. It's always siphoned off, and that's the whack-a-mole part because that's where people like to keep whacking, you know, because there, there's more of the whack happens, the more siphoning happens. And uh, nobody ever says, hey, let's, uh, you know, basically uh, when you say productivity and uh, real personal income, it's just kind of like our institutions are basically uh, uh, they're haywire as far as how much capital earns and how much labor earns. It's not balanced. And so then uh, uh, real personal income can't grow and uh, nobody wants to face that. And uh, I think we all will really, really quickly because like uh, the whack-a-mole is about broke. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't have anything like specifically to say to that, you know, because I think it's it, it's it's definitely something we have to. There's all kinds of practical things we have to do. I don't want to get specific about that stuff, because I have my own views about things like that. I'm interested while I'm here, whatever I am on this earth, is looking at it in a different way, going to more the deep issues. Certainly, we could banter for hours about the different things. The politicians do it every day. It happens on CNN every day, Fox News, mouths going back and forth. That's part of what happens. Um, yeah, I certainly don't want to try to uh, make a discussion about what will work and what won't work, except on one thing. I would say involvement will work and, and disengagement won't work. And uh, I'm, so, I'm not so sure that so many people that are studying spirituality are not confusing uh, that disengagement is what comes out of uh, their understanding of, of uh, what is my true self. And that if once I, uh, and, and I guess, I, I believe that, and, I, and what I see is that they have a belief that if I get, if I get this part understood and, and, uh, and focused right, uh, by hocus pocus, the world will work. And uh, I know they're, they're heading for a deep, deep, deep disaster. Richard? Richard? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, that's, 
that's kind of a that's kind of a misconception that you're expressing about uh, awakening. You know, when a when a being wakes up, they're uh, they're a hundred percent responsible because the world is within them. Now, and since these beings appear to be in bodies who have experiences, they all act differently. Uh, each each form has its place, and action happens naturally uh, when you're no longer conflicted in the present moment with il illusory pasts and illusory futures. When you're no longer conflicted with fear and desire, then the moment can be dealt with in a very beautiful way. And actually, most moments in truth, from a, from the point of view of consciousness, are really quite clear, simple, and direct. Um, you know, when we get into uh, a hypothetical conversation that's envisioning all these circumstances, um, and this is the typical way that we've tried to run our lives as, as the human ego mind, then we've never really dealt with <laughs> The real problem with the world, if you want to know what it is, it's lack of attention, uh, and lack of presence. We're just, there's no one here. There's no one home. And, 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 and people have given their power away to structures, uh, programs, and conditions that basically are running the show. So when we, when we take responsibility for our presence, when we show up, when we, when we bring ourselves to each moment with, with attention, and hopefully if we can let go of the, the false illusions about who we are, which really add up to be our desires and our fears. So if that's not in the moment, and if our thinking is not in the moment, if the, if the primary thing that we bring to this moment, and I'm talking actually about this video and being here right now, if what we're really bringing to this is consciousness, is being, then, then what can come out of this moment can be very helpful, can be very true. And I totally read you because, like, uh, uh, if we live in concepts, uh, a concept is kind of like a way we can try to uh, fix part of the world. And then we can vacate because we don't need to be there because we believe that a concept which is fixed is what's true. And if we don't live in concepts, then we do have to meet the world at every moment. And this presence, this actually attention that you're talking about, would be the natural uh, what's left over. I don't know. Is that kind of well stated? Well, yeah. And the other thing is, is that you have to understand that awakening really means that in a very literal sense, there is no fear and desire. Okay, there is no lack. Yeah, there's no desire, but there's compassion, right? There, there is what you are. There's, you know, I mean, th these are just words, but there's peace. There's a, a calm joy. There's a relaxation. There's, there's love. Because you have you have, first of all, you allow, you are consciousness. It allows for everything. There's no conditions. It accepts whatever appears. It's not, it's not, it's not like the legal system. It's not a, it's not a matter of, of judgment. There's a, it's not even a matter of forgiveness. Everything is forgiven. It's all, it's all the self, all self. I mean, this is a radical awakening. We are waking out of self out of separation, the illusion of separation. There is only self alone. This is really the truth. This is all that's here. And this, when, when you engage your world from that consciousness, there are no questions. There are no doubts. There are no insecurities. And action is taken in the present. Creation happens now. There's no speculation. There's no... See, all the things that we do in our mind are, are fear mechanisms. They're defense mechanisms. They're escape mechanisms. We're afraid to be present. We're afraid to be whole. We're afraid to be who we are, which is really... We're afraid to be loved. Uh, you know, and... And, it, and it's, an, it's a, it's a counterintuitive process because you're letting go. 
uh, of everything that you thought you were, as opposed to, you know, accumulating more and more things and more and more powers and more and more abilities. This is a completely counterintuitive process. You're finding out who you are when all of that stress is released, when you let go of everything. Like, you know, there's a lot of good emotional uh, healing processes that are out there in the world now, uh, where the main activity is uh, to let go of what you can let go of, to, to let the energies flow through you, to let the emotions, the thoughts, the judgments, the opinions just flow through you. You experience them, you meet them, and then you just, you literally say to yourself, it's fine, I'll let, I'll let them go. And then what's amazing about that process is you realize, well, geez, this is a pretty good process. <laughs> if I can let go of all these things, I wonder how much, and, and feel better and feel peace, I wonder how much I can let go of. And if you really get you know, somewhat perverse about it, you could just really let go of everything and then you know, see, see who you are. This is a very, there's an energy that happens to the human being. It's, it's called courage in this process of awakening. You become courageous. You become very adventurous. You want to you wanna take a real look uh, at what is true and what is not true. And so there's two movements. There's the, there's the awareness of what's not true and then the let go. You know, maybe, maybe that used to run your life. Maybe you were really uh, operating by believing in certain things. And then once you see that they're not true, you let those beliefs go. And you start to let a lot of things go because this process uh, builds on itself. You become stronger. You become more healthy. You become more free. And you sense that. Yeah, by letting, that letting go of your... You no, know, you pretty much... Letting go of your personal anxiety somehow empowers you, right? I mean, uh, it, it allows you just to function as a, as a what, it, what you really truly are. And uh, however that is, a full-fledged human being or something. But I mean, if you let go of uh, the manifest world too, uh, then what good is that empowerment? Can, can I say something about that? Uh, like with with my work with addiction, okay. So some people come to me and they say, "Okay, I'm trying to quit smoking. Um, I'm I've just got off heroin. Um, I, I drink too much, but I'm willing to stop." And what they come with is a lot of ideas about. Should I should I just not buy cigarettes? Should we should we should we make drugs legal? Should we make that drug illegal? Should we? How can you help me? Like, can we stop the internet sale of painkillers? You can do anything you want right there, but you're still dealing with something right here, which is the sense of 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 lack and the addiction that's running the show from the sense of who you are. Okay, so it's just that mentality. If I can fix everything out here, what I think is out here, then maybe I'll be okay. It's like backwards. So what if you started here and you said, what is this energy right here and what's looking at it? And just rest into that. Oh, that's, I see that there's fear there. Okay. And then when I'm not feeling that, there's this, this mechanism that says, feel better, find something, go feel better. Oh, there's something. Take that. Whew. Ah. And so if you start there and those energies are allowed to come through, like this, all of a sudden, people say, it's not so important whether we legalize or don't legalize that drug. It's not so important whether the cigarettes are in the house or not in the house. And the reason is because they took it from... So what I'm saying is the possibility that all of these things that you're talking about in the manifest world are actually... They are what we are. They're, they're, this, it's all one thing kind of happening. And if it changes from within... I'm not going to say it magic, magically fixes everything. But to ask the question from the point of view, I am an inherent self, and how do I fix the world of inherent things? It's like, a, oh my God, I, got, I don't even like know how to start with that because it just seems like backwards to me now. But if I start from the, the point of view of what is this that I am? What is this? Like, I don't know. Like, okay, that changes things. That changes the, the way that my whatever relationship we want to say that we have to what's happening gets changed in that. And so if that's the case, it would probably, something would change in the way of all sorts of things, the legal system, the, the debt issues, the government, whether we have a government, what the government looks like, uh, all those kinds of things. And there are practical things that would happen from that. But I would just say start from, you know, when I, when I, became, when I became interested in recovery, I didn't just want to learn how to not use by 
getting rid of the object or changing the object because it didn't it was a band-aid fix you see what i mean so that's all that i'm inviting to do but we could still have a conversation about practical measures that we take well you know like practical measures okay you're talking about a sphere of action that and that's kind of around here when i realize that i don't need drugs well i'm, I'm not interested in it i lose interest now a uh, sphere of practical action could be to uh, somehow create uh, have a uh, or stimulate a creative outlet for everybody's energy that lives in the ghetto. And I think if they had a decent job, they probably wouldn't be interested in drugs anymore. They would have a really cool family and, and they'd have uh, vibrant kids and uh, they would be thinking about how to build their school system. And, uh, uh, and, and, but uh, the fact is, is that even in Chicago, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the center of the ghettos, 48% uh, of, uh, of black males are unemployed. And so then, of course, they're looking for somewhere to use that energy. They got this huge energy. And uh, what are they going to do with it? They're going to have to numb it or somehow uh, 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 contend with it or deal with it. Right. So we have to look within the existing systems and structures, as Zendan said. And so now we have these two parties which are going to try to fix this. But they're, they're arguing with themselves so much because they're, they think they're Republicans and Democrats that they'll often just side with an issue because they think they're a Democrat. So they can't even get on board and make some sort. There's a consciousness change that can happen there, but that's where I'm going with this. I keep seeing something else like it within what you're saying. Until that's dealt with, I don't know how to deal. I mean, obviously, practical measures. Elect lawmakers that make the right decisions. Get involved if you want. You can do all, you can do all of that. But I don't think it goes deep enough. Well, one at a time. What is there? No, a because is there a critical mass then? Go ahead, Sundance. Well... I think Scott is pointing out a dilemma, and I think that there's there's something that we need to see here. Hopefully we will see it. We don't need to see it, but I think there's the opportunity. There's a core issue um, that changes the game completely. It's core. It's, it's, it's essential. And unless, and I would, I would say this boldly, unless there is a true change of consciousness of a collective nature, nothing will actually really change because what you're really dealing with um, without that change of consciousness is just programming and conditioning or reactions. You don't have any actual responses. And again, it, the problem with the world is just a, an illusion of consciousness. It's a state of consciousness where there is no presence. And without presence, this is what the world looks like. If you bring presence to the world, if, you, if the world is in you and you are presence, then what will emerge out of that consciousness will look very, 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 very different. Because if all I see when I look out these eyes is myself, if all I touch is myself, if all I hear is myself, and the only time I am ever there is now, just now, if there's no such thing as time, if there's only presence, there's only self, and it's all within, then there's, there's some, there's, there is, it'll, it'll be handled naturally. And in effect, that's God. And when we show up and, and be as God is, then it'll all be taken care of. And actually, it is all taken care of anyway. I mean, a lot of these fears that we're having are just like having a dream. All we have to do is wake up from that dream to realize that the dream was not real. And, and we can talk about this unreal dream as though it's real, and, and give it reality by that very conversation. You know, we're given the opportunity um, to transcend it. And the only way we can transcend it is to no longer identify with the mind-made self. And I'll, I'll just share one personal thing. that When I really had a what I would call a significant shift in my own seeking, it happened very um, uh, or ordinarily. I mean, it wasn't a spectacular event, but 
at one particular moment, something dropped and it was my seeking into the mind for my self-identity. For some reason, I, you know, I had, I'd been free and then not free, as Scott says, I've been free and then not free, going back and forth between this new consciousness and the old consciousness, uh, still having a personal self. And at some point, I just realized, and it, it was a point of love, too. It, it had to do with my, my relationship, and I was, in a, I was in a seminar, and there was a lot of intensity of, of the moment that brought me to a truth. We were, I think you mentioned integrity before we ever started the show. And by doing as Scott has been talking about and I've been talking about, I saw that the thoughts that were running through my mind were all untrue, irrevocably untrue. Not one single belief was true. And I ended up sitting there with nothing. And what I realized is that, that that's who I am. I have, I have, I experience thinking, I experience concepts, but they have nothing, nothing to do with me, nothing to do with who I am. No experience, nothing has anything to do with who I am. And yet I'm not separate from anything because I cannot say that, that I'm not aware of the world as it is, that I'm not aware of this body as it is or anything in the present environment as it is, but it's a real shift in identity. And what I'm saying is that when we shift to that identity of being who we really are, which is the self, one self, then we are totally responsible. I mean, these conspiracies, these dilemmas, these dualities are all within us. And so the solution is within us too. So then there's no external, Absolutely. there's no external solution. What did you mean when you said, uh, when we come to this presence, who's we? Well, I'm speaking figuratively, you know, of us, you know, people, so-called people. Us three, right? Let's say we're, us three are here, but the world is kind of going to shit. Oh, <laughs> In spite of us, the world is still kind of going down the, the slippery slope. Hey, Richard, can I, can, I, can I address what you're saying right there? Because I'm trying to meet you with this question because I, I can feel where you're coming from. I want to try to meet you there with that a little bit. Is that, you know, okay, what Sundance just said is my own experience. So the way that I used to experience myself was like the question was how am I going to fix my life? How am I going to fix myself? How am I going to figure out everything? And so everything was thought of like, okay, that, that's what I am, that story, that consciousness. And I was always like trying to figure it out in the future uh, so that once I get that figured out, then I'll be okay. Well, if that happens on a, you know, that's what we kind of do on a collective level. We kind of we get together and we go, what are we going to do about ourselves? Like we sort of try, what are we going to do in the future? Um, treating that as inherently real. Um, and then... Uh, there also is an assumption in your question that I want to address when you say, because people think that this is a detached thing. It's like every day I get up, I take a shower, I, uh, I work, worked as an attorney for years. I pay my mortgage. I vote. I uh, work with people. I donate money. I do all those things. Okay. So there's no, the disengagement is like a myth. I don't. There might be people who are disassociated, but that's its own thing. It's like a disassociation thing. I, it's not my experience, but 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 I still want to come back to the issue of the way that we try to figure out our problems is is the same way that a self tries to figure out itself. The way we try to collectively right now figure out the problem is the way that a self tries to do. It. It's like the same thing. So how do we know what's going to emerge? Um, out of out of this we don't know because when you see that you're not a self you don't know what's going to happen to you i don't know what's going to happen to me doesn't mean i don't take practical steps like right do this plan that but there's not a sense of self wrapped into it but i don't know what's going to happen and i think that the collective kind of anxiety happens because we want to know what's going to happen we want to know we got to fix this and so all the questions come from that anxiety ridden kind of sense of how we exist the questions come from that and then we expect the answers to come from that but they don't come that way uh, okay, 
that just don't come that way. So it's it's hard to have this kind of conversation in a way. It's like I I don't know. Like I, I really don't know because I don't know about my own life, but I function. Functioning happens fine, and it doesn't mean that I've detached because I mean if you look at my life, I'm if you would say that in all appearances I'm busier now than I've ever been. Like doing things <laughs> i'm reading so, you really good on when you say like uh, uh all the questions come from anxiety and all the answers come from anxiety and yet the part that i don't kind of uh, get, uh connect is then activity happens out of uh a- activity happens out of uh knowing my my true self and i don't see that activity i guess well i mean you know okay so if i'm if i'm if i'm reaching up to the mind so to speak uh, because of anxiety that's going on, all those things rising together, anxiety, the time-bound story, and then trying to work my life out on that level, right? Okay, so that's where I try to deal with that. And if, if that's seen through, then what's left is what's left, which is not that. And it's something just, you know, you, you can't really, it's like it's different than, than thinking of myself as that. We kind of think of ourselves as like little thought machines that figure everything out like that. Well, you can't do that. As much because what you thought was real in that does not seem to be real anymore, and also what is real in that is not what what you thought was real anymore. So it's different. I mean, um, that's all I can say about that. It's. Well, I would love know, to give you all sorts of political opinions, and I have them. I have, I have all sorts of opinions. I'll give them to you. They're like little passing thoughts that come through that say this guy should be out of office or that guy. What I'm interested in is something different, which is. What would it be like if we see through what we're taking to be inherently real? What would that be like? And then how would that move? I don't know because I don't know how it moves every day. I have no idea. I'm I'm, I'm waiting to see how it moves. You know. I mean, is it is it really true that uh, we do anything? I mean, is that really true? Isn't it more true if we really investigate it that everything just happens and that the mind elusively or falsely takes up ownership of it. I mean, I agree with Scott. I mean, actually, when, you're, when, you're, when your programs and conditionings are out of the way, uh, everything just happens naturally. You know, you're washing the dishes. And, you know, before when I was, you know, identified with my mind, I used to be never doing anything with real presence. I was always thinking other things while I was doing something. So... I was enmeshed with my mind while I was doing something as simple as washing the dishes. But you know, you don't need your mind to wash the dishes. There's an intelligence that knows how to do everything that it's seen. It's just the same as little children. And you ever see how they learn when they're just sponges for learning? And the primary way that they learn is they just pay attention. They give their attention to something. They just look and they feel and they sense. And pretty soon they, they know how to do it. And, and they try things without any kind of ego um, dilemma. You know, they don't, they don't calculate, you know, how they're going to feel when they make a mistake. They just dive in, they jump in, they start moving the knobs, and they try it this way, and they try it that way. And, and they learn how to play video games, really complex video games. I have a grandchild that actually uses the computer quite successfully, and he can't read. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's, and then you know, we can have this experience. We can have this experience of life becoming very ordinary and very simple. And you're just moving. You're always impelled to move about. I mean, the body, you know, it, you get, you, like, you get a thought. It just comes into your mind to um, go have a bonbon from the freezer. <laughs> and uh, you get up and, and you walk over there and you do it. But you're just doing that. You're not. You're not doing anything else. You, this is just, it's a real simplicity. It's just a clarity. You're just there. And, and everything can be taken care of. There's a lot of forms, and each has, a, has special abilities and capabilities and presence within the structure. And, and, and then you're loved, so you're giving, and you, and you will give these gifts. You will give your music. You will give your economic intelligence. You will give your love of nature and your farming, all of this will come naturally when we are not you know, in conflict with each other and when we're fearless and when our hearts have moved to the frequency of, of peace and love so that we actually are 
are seeing ourselves everywhere and are serving. You know, I I say that the one job of the future, there's only going to be one job, just one. It's called it's going to be service. Service to if if, if this world is ever lucky enough, grace enough to become a conscious world, it will be a world where there is only one activity, and that is serving others, because there are no others. There's just the self. And as I said when we started, I mean, this is radical. It's a radical awakening. It's a radical realization. And it solves um, all of our problems because there are no problems. <laughs> there are no problems. Actually, the, then the possibility of that is is really real and palpable. Actually, the serving part of it, because when I've seen groups of people get together around addiction, okay, so what happens is they start to recognize presence, start to rest into that and see that. What they find is very quite naturally they kind of become interested in serving, like they just they just do that. It's just it's just so automatic because it's just like love. I mean, that's a good enough word for me. Is that's what starts to ha actually happen? I'm actually seeing that happen with people. Uh, so what would that be like then? Uh, we don't know what that would be like, but there's there's a palpable possibility that, 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 that what we're talking about actually does bring about a compassion, if you want to use the word, a compassion and care and concern for everybody. But I think the mind wants to say, okay, well then what will that look like? Like, so let's fix that then. And, and, and it's like getting ahead of itself in a way. It's like it's trying to go back to that old way of thinking, like everything is yeah. inherently real, I'm inherently real, and then trying to fix it from within that. And that, that's why the, 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 the dialogue is uh, like this, you know, in a way. I mean, I know where you're coming from, Richard, but I... Um... Well, I think all three of us are just uh, already in the future job. We're all doing service. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I mean, uh, I'm totally energized and totally in gear and uh, uh, doing more now than I've ever done in, in my whole life uh, on a day by day basis. There you go. Right. Yeah. And so you didn't have to, you see how you didn't have to figure that out beforehand. You didn't have to say, like, how are we going to do the service? You see what I mean? Because service comes so naturally. It's like, what, what do you mean? Like, what do you mean? How do I do service? It's like. This is what I do. It just happens. I mean, so then part of my service or my only service is probably just to empower people to do service. Right. And it seems like there there's a there's a look to it, you know, and uh, maybe they're doing service in their basement or something like that, you know. But I mean, uh, maybe they're doing service on the street and uh, those that are on the street, I go out on the street and I, I congratulate them for the service they're doing and uh, thank them. And uh Okay, lately I've been going to Occupy Chicago, and uh, when I speak there, uh, I speak to everyone, and everyone's willing to speak to me. It's like an amazing opening that uh, uh, has never been here even a couple of months ago in my life, and uh, I don't know what words are coming out of my mouth either. I have no clue what I'm saying, and I'm not doing, I'm not doing it. I don't have any scripts, but I mean, uh, I'm uh, really in motion with it, and uh and I, and I say, what's the best thing we can do to people? I say, the best thing we can do is talk to our friends and say, this is, this is, an, enor this is an enormous and huge opportunity. And I don't really uh, speak about who should get into office and who should get out of office. And I don't really squander my attention on issues. And the only one issue is that uh, we are one. And that's what they're saying uh, down there, you know, that we're the 99 is what, the way they phrase it. But uh, basically, that's their way of saying we are one. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm for you, you know, I'm not against anything or anybody. I'm just for you. And that would be the only thing I would say. And uh, I'm not so sure that uh, the, uh, the spiritual teaching points to that in a very good way. I mean, I guess it's left for you to discover. When you discover yourself, you just have to trust that, uh, okay, these guys will know what to do with that. And uh, I don't know. I think there's a long period of, uh, of confusion where people uh, think that they're supposed to be in uh, some kind of, a, you know, once they start doing practice and get a taste of uh, timelessness and spaciousness and, uh, and uh, peace, that that's how life supposedly looks from then on in. And they're trying hey, to re Richard. recreate that. 
Maybe we shouldn't call it spiritual teaching. How about just um, wisdom? You know, um, wisdom teaching. Well, how about just wisdom? How about just maturity? How about just uh, becoming awake and intelligent? I'm good for that. You know, uh, I mean, uh, the the spiritual part of it is true. I mean, that provides the freedom from death. That is the real dilemma of the ego. Um, because that's the anxiety, and and that's the guilt, and phew, it's it's a real mess. Um, what if what if you knew for a fact that there's no such thing as death? You'd probably that you slow, were here before. The, you'd probably slow down. You were here before. <laughs> slow down. You probably would, you know, because you'd say, well, you'd, "What's the you'd point enjoy, of running?" You'd enjoy. You'd relax. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't take things so seriously. I mean, we're really talking about a, a real serious dilemma on 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 the on the uh, level of birth and death and identification with the body. Unfortunately, as far as I know, all the bodies um, are temporary. They don't last. So if that's who you think you are, if that's what society has told you is the truth, and if that's your belief, then this is what society looks like based on that. Well, you know, because of that, are we uh, are we leaving a legacy? Are we leaving a legacy of the uh, that the planet is temporary? Planet is temporary. Did you say that? <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. In other what words, we're. We believe that we're temporary, so then uh, we're fixing it so that the, uh, even the planet Earth is temporary. Well, I mean, you know, temporary everything oh, is. Yeah. And if you look, everything that's happening, everything's shifting, changing, moving constantly within uh, awareness. I mean, everything is. So I, to me, that brings great peace. I mean, to me, that, 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 to see that everything is not what I thought it was. I, I thought things, I thought I was this, like you said, this body, this permanent self. I thought you were a permanent object self. Everything's permanent, fixed, like that. Uh, there's great peace in that impermanence and seeing that it's not like that at all. And death, you know, is not what it appears to be. Because the self is not what it appears to be. And I think that has to, that ties in, like you said, just to all the a lot of the anxiety that's going on. I mean, it is kind of like we're running away in a way. Like it's just the appearance of running away from what to what. Very good. We're running away from ourselves and and from this moment, and we're running to uh, a, a bigger dream, I guess. You know, we can define everything as a problem and uh, as an anxiety-based problem, and we can also define everything as a enormous. Uh, and wonderful opportunity. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I would say, I don't know if Sundance was suffering a lot, but I mean, I think that the, a lot of the people that are suffering and seeking, if you start to look at it as an, the opportunity to find out who you are, you know. That's to me, when we, to bring it back to the beginning of the conversation, when you said, what's, what's going on? Do you see things happening? I mean, I think, as my question is, again, is like, well, where do we think all this is leading? All of the fear about the world ending and the economic collapse and what and this war and that war, where is it all leading? Uh, so a lot of anxiety, a lot of seeking, a lot of personal suffering, a lot of collective suffering. Well, where is that going to go? I mean, it can only go a certain place. It's just, we just increase, we just sort of like tune up the suffering, just keep tuning it up, tuning it up, tuning it up for what? Until something goes, well, maybe there's a different way. Maybe I'm going to look at this differently, you know? I like the unknown. I like the mystery. You know, for one thing, it lets you off the hook. Actually, thinking you know is, an, is a tremendous stress and a tremendous suffering. And yes, as ego, I, I suffered almost constantly, um, oftentimes below the level of my own awareness. I was never happy. And uh, so 
I think it's natural for us as human beings to seek happiness. And the great opportunity is that we can find out, you know, who we really are and, and, and be as that, you know, be consciousness. I mean, it's a funny thing. Katie and I, in our, in our satsangs, our meetings with people, we often point out, you know, when people are telling us stories of their suffering, um, we ask them to take a look at the awareness of that suffering and see if it is suffering, the awareness itself. Does the awareness suffer? And for a lot of people, that is an incredible aha. They didn't really actually realize that there was a part, in, a very big part, a very real part of themselves that was not at all involved with that suffering and never is involved with that suffering. No matter what appears in awareness, and many fun things appear and many uh, miserable things appear. But the fact of the matter is, if you actually have, you know, it's like, where are you looking from? If you have your attention on awareness itself, in other words, I'm aware that I am aware. I'm aware that I'm aware. And then life is going on and you're doing what you're doing. But a major part of that is I am aware that I am aware, which is really called also presence. In other words, you're never really anywhere without being present. You're not standing in a bank line waiting to cash a check without being aware that you are aware being aware of your existence. Now this, I, I don't think that people necessarily do know in, in a, to a large extent, but they certainly can know what a joy it is to just be aware of your own existence uh, moment by moment, to see what a gift that is, what a joy that is, what a relaxation that is. So, you know, um, That's it. I hope I didn't sound too anxious because really, uh, I really enjoy myself when I uh, when I share with people. I mean, uh, even the Occupy business when I'm uh, going on the train down down to the center of the city, I just uh, feel so elated and so wonderful, you know, that I'm going to go down and react with people. And when I'm talking to them, I feel so great about it. And when I'm and telling them that, uh, you know, Things aren't the way we we believe they are, and, uh, and you know. And obviously, the solution is to be here and to to look and see for yourself, and not listen to somebody else that uh, is going to tell you what the what the proper take is. And uh, and I feel so great when I'm leaving and, and on the train coming home, and just feeling like. Uh, what an opportunity to just keep this going and put what I captured on video on YouTube and share what people are saying, not because it's the right thing or the wrong thing, but they're participating. And somehow, I mean, uh, somehow I'm such a firm believer in, in engagement. And uh, I don't know, I guess uh, that's the only way I've really learned is by engaging. And I've spent a lot of my life disengaged. And, uh, if I would regret it anything, maybe that's what it would be. But I, I don't intend to let that happen again. And uh, somehow that's where, where my my take on it is. Thank you. <clears throat> well, you know the um, there's been a lot of talk in, at this time um, between the two words. Uh, what, we don't want to come from love anymore. I mean, from fear anymore. We want to come from love. You know, there's a big contrast that's being put up in front of our consciousness between fear and love. And the people at the Occupy movements all over the country are really um, expressing that love is the answer. And I hope, I really do hope in my heart that that is not the mind's love that they're talking about, which is the opposite of fear. But I hope that there really is an opportunity in these movements to actually come from uh, a very balanced equanimity that does not have uh, judgment 
involved in it um, as though that, you know, sometimes I get a little worried when I see people fighting the cops and, and calling them names and where the two sides seem to be very polarized. Unfortunately, that doesn't meet up to this, this transcendence from fear to love. But I do see movements um, or, or the elements of movements in the world where it appears that people are actually becoming quite fearless. Um, where they, they're, they're, they're taking action that calls for an, a tremendous amount of courage, which is a higher energy, a higher frequency than, than we've seen from people in the past. So I actually am very hopeful that, um, that we actually will surrender fear, whatever it takes. Well, you know, all here, the in, mechanisms here in and all the conditioning here in Chicago, it's not polarized. And uh, I haven't seen anything that was really polarized. I think I, I see the police as knowing that uh, this is for them and that uh, and it's an arrangement. It's a ballet that's, uh, that's uh, unfolding and both sides are participating in it, number one. And number two is I see it's a, a, a great opportunity for the wisdom community. And uh, notice I changed the, <laughs> the language there <laughs> to do some coaching. And to say, you know, and I, I say it over and over again when I'm down there, this is way, way bigger than who's to blame for it, you know? Right. Yeah. Thank I, you. I think that's an important, I was going to say that, I think that's an important point. It's just when you mentioned the polarity, is that we often say who's to blame, we often sort of find an enemy. And, you know, that can come into question too, the whole, that whole way of thinking of, um, strict right and wrong and polarity and that's something to look at as part of this whole thing is where is that coming from is that coming from the sense of identity is it coming from that love and compassion that sundance spoke so well of is that is more rooted in seeing through the self or is it you know are we you know that's just important points to bring up and maybe that's how the, the wisdom community can open up that conversation for people but it really becomes a conversation that we that we all have like it's not just spiritual teachers quote unquote it's it's this is a conversation uh, you know that can happen without ever using the word wisdom or spirituality even definitely without that you know because like uh the way i see it is pe it just never crossed people's mind not to blame someone because uh, i mean <laughs> that and you know they never thought that that was another option you know <laughs> right. and to see something deeper there and uh uh i say and i say it's all and 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 the way I work it is actually I, I acknowledge people's pain because I think that's really important to acknowledge people's pain and, and not acknowledge that there's a lot of injustice. And, but I, I also coach that uh, don't uh, fragment your attention by jumping on issues because this is way bigger than issues. It's called a broken system and it can be repaired, uh, maybe not totally, but somehow it can be, it, uh, it can be repaired and, and when, uh, uh, a broken system is repaired, then all the, all the injustices will be included in that and, and people's pain will be, be uh, ameliorated uh, through that. And uh, I think it's going to take all our, our attention to focus on our togetherness. And uh, we won't have any attention to squander on one guy's issues over another guy's issues or this is, you know, like, uh, like politicians usually do, trying to um, get the issue that benefits their, their state or their their city the most. We don't have that energy, and the, and, the, and coaching is you know it's what we're always doing, what we're all doing anyhow. We're coaching people that come to us, right? I'm coaching whether I speak or whether I uh, just uh, uh, broadcast, and uh, you guys have a following that uh, uh, that uh, comes to you for advice, or even if as attorneys people come to you for advice. Right, and, and to clear the record, I'm actually in active status as an attorney, so I don't want to put myself out there as an attorney. You know, just, uh, <laughs> okay, well, don't pay your dues anymore. <laughs> I'm also an active. Oh, gosh. <laughs> We're dead for legal advice. Okay, well, anyhow. Uh, so I thank you guys so much. Sundance, far out. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Thank Richard. you. Appreciate Thank you, Richard. Pleasure. You definitely uh, are a server um, from the heart. I appreciate it <laughs> yeah. very much. And it was delightful um, 
to meet Scott for the first time. I, uh, I you, hope that we uh, continue our relationship. And thank you everyone for watching. Thanks for coming to Never Not Here. Uh, we're trying to bring something important to you that makes a difference in your life, but also something that's relevant and can make, uh, you know, you just see what's happening in a way that you don't get blindsided and you don't have that anxiety attack because you know uh, things are amiss if they're amiss and uh, things are right if they're right, and whether it's an interpretation or not. I mean, we live in a shared, uh, share a world of shared interpretation, and uh, somehow I think uh, both of us, all the three of us, are saying that that's part, you know, that's part and parcel of of uh, wholeness is uh, also appearances. Uh, did I go too far on that one? I don't know. It's all good. Yeah. Okay. Bye for this time. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys.